room with her because I wasn't the person that she thought I was. And where does this fit into just, uh, you use the word chaos, but yep. uh, we would use the political uncertainties of America yep. voting for Trump or electing Trump at any rate, uh, us voting to leave the European Union, we've been in for 40 years, uh, the Italians uh, voting for fringe parties, strong men emerging elsewhere. Is that the chaos you're Brutal talking men. about? I wouldn't call them strong. Brutal and strong aren't the same thing, and people shouldn't confuse them. So, but fair enough. Well, strong men's a, as you know. I know, uh, I know, a, I know. But it's an unfortunate term because it confuses strength with brutality, and, and I think that is a mistake. And you know, because to be strong is to be resilient and and to be noble and to be courageous, not yeah. to oppress. So people. you wouldn't see the Putins and the King Jongans and the Donald Trumps as being role models. Well, I wouldn't lump those three together. The first two I would. Trump is his own sort of creature, and I'm not exactly sure what to make of them, but I certainly wouldn't consider them strong in any, in any admirable sense. So Trump, you wouldn't put in that category? No, no. He's no. fairly brutal in the way he talks about his opponents and consequences of some of his yeah, actions we've Trump seen in the Middle East. I don't think that Trump is a phenomenon that hasn't been seen before in American politics. There's been lots of times in the last 30 years when the president? Americans were put in... Ah, things were pretty pretty strange around the time of Nixon. And from 1968 to 1972, the U.S. was more polarized than it is now. So I think we've seen this sort of thing before. I mean, Trump is a strange guy, and he's come up to the presidency through his own peculiar route. But Americans are still 50% Republican and 50% Democrat, right down the line like they have been for the last four elections. Their future, the strength uh, of the Good a Friday of agreement as There's well. A great deal of well, I think people in Northern it. Ireland do know what they're talking well, about. Well, I'm with talking the to Northern respect. Ireland people as well, and I have to also say that yesterday in the committee proceedings, we went into this. It was in public. It was on television. It's mm. been seen by people, and the fact is that all this talk about cameras, there are cameras there already around the area. Right. That is not how right. people are feeling. Well, in, let in, me. In, sorry. I don't want to intrude into Northern Ireland right now. From an outsider's perspective. Jordan, are you a spiritual Brexiteer? I have some sympathy with people's desire to disentangle themselves from r rulers who are too far away in the power hierarchy from them. What so, a good point. Why? Well, because as people move away from you up hierarchies, it's harder and harder for them to represent you properly at a local level. And I also have a tremendous amount of faith, I would say, all things considered, in, in the people of the UK to muddle through properly because they've been doing that for a very, very long time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'd bet <laughs> my sense right. as a Canadian is that I'd bet on Britain. All right. But, but the unveiling wasn't quite the triumph that grassroots well, out uh, would have hoped. Well, not for the first time. You've misled me uh, by asking me to come in and talk about the referendum, but instead wanting to talk about me. I'm sure we if haven't you, misled you. you. Hang had... on, hang on, hang on. No, no, I'm sure no, no, we I haven't misled on. you. No, I won't hang on. If you had told me... What, that, I was coming in, that I was coming in to discuss me, I would have said there are much bigger issues that the British people are occupied by than six or however many vox pops but you this had. this is going on to people. the issue, as you say, of the referendum. Well, because th it's let's talk powerful. about the referendum, All right, but shall just, we? Let's, let's just talk be, about well, the yes, referendum. I want you to shall answer we? this. You want to defend you know, what you're doing here. I don't here. want to defend me at all. You're not my judge. You're not fit to be my judge. Well, thank you very much. All I'm trying to say is, are you going to be a benefit to this campaign well, if there are people that are going to work out? You asked me to come in to this studio. Yes. I didn't ask you. You told me you wanted to hear my views on the referendum and I do. on the European Union. So can we move on to that, please? Well, are you happy to link arms, to use the Prime Minister's expression, I don't with others that you, with that you do anybody. not agree with? I don't link arms with anybody. Well, you are I metaphorically have a it's a binary. It's a binary choice. Right. You're in or you're out. The last fellow you had on who said he wouldn't share a platform with me claimed £40,000 off the taxpayer to heat his horses in a stable. Right, well, Would on. I really want to link arms with him? No. But if he can bring any no voters into the polling booth, and if I can bring any no voters into the polling booth, I hope that that will be enough. So this issue, what we were trying to say about this whole interview, mm. is that this issue, as far as you're concerned, is bigger it's than childish. people's... It's such a childish but, thing. Well, except, except, you know, well, Tony Blair is for yes. Does that mean that anybody 
uh, whose for yes is associated with Tony Blair. It's such childish discourse. Right, except that political bedfellows can sometimes lead people to say, oh, is one being authentic about the issue? If, for example, you said about Nigel Farage, his aid smear should disqualify him from any civilised company henceforth. But you're going to put that aside in order to campaign for this issue, which you think is bigger... It's bigger than, than all issues. Right. It okay. will affect so what the do lives, you say... the future of all of our people for the rest of time. So what do you say to those people who obviously don't feel it is bigger than their personal antipathy well, towards you? Well, more fool them. I hope they're not going to vote for the European Union because they don't like me. That would be a very foolish and childish thing to do. But are you worried that you might be turning off some people who would like to support grassroots? But you out? asked me to come here. Presumably because you thought I had something that some people might be interested to hear. Yes, and we will get on to it. But it is important, isn't it, well, if you're trying to I don't know when push... we'll get on to it. We're almost finished the interview. How do you know? Might have you on here for another 10, 15 minutes. I very much now, look, doubt that. You're right. I'm not going to have you on for a 10, 15 minutes. But if you're going to convince people of an argument, they've got to believe in the big players Please that are there. Please stop this. Please stop this. You misled me into coming in here today. And every question you've asked has been about me. I'm campaigning amongst my one million followers on social media, on the radio, on the television, on platforms, on the streets, for Britain to leave for a series of important reasons to which you have not yet turned. I will get to it if you would just answer the one question then. No, but I don't want... When have you ever not so wanted to talk about you, George Galloway? it's so Galloway. childish. It's so tabloid. It's so Daily Mail. God forbid we should ever be tabloid here at the BBC. Are you and Nigel Farage going to be able to attract and keep enough support for this campaign that you say is important enough well, to override any well, other personality or politics? I don't know because the public haven't voted yet. But I am convinced that Britain... That's a question coming from the live chat. Yes, you can have my thoughts on Brexit, Tom. The other day I was doing a lecture on the on the stories in Genesis, and one of the stories that I analyzed briefly, and this will be posted very soon, is the story of the Tower of Babel. And I've been very curious about that story. It, it comes after Noah's flood myth in Genesis. And it's a very interesting story. And what happens is that human beings get together and they decide to build a, a massive building. And the human beings that are building the, that building all speak in one voice. And they have this grand vision, which you might regard as a utopian vision, which is what I think it is, that they can build a building so high that within it everyone will speak the same language and it will reach all the way to heaven. And so you could see it in some sense as an attempt to usurp the transcendent. Um, I kind of read it as an, e an early precursor of the story that Milton told in Paradise Lost, where Satan, who's God's highest heavenly angel, and perhaps, and who's Lucifer, the the, 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 the brightest light in the psychic hierarchy, you might say, and, and the spirit of untrammeled rationality, decides that he can wage war in heaven and overcome God, overcome the ultimate in the transcendent value. And I read that as a cautionary tale about the pride that goes along with intellectual presupposition, and the same pride that produced the totalitarian states of the 20th century. What happens with the Tower of Babel is that human beings start to build this uh, unitary, homogenous structure whose pinnacle will reach into God's heavenly domain, perhaps thereby taking the place of the transcendent. God gets wind of that and goes to earth and takes the people or, or transforms the people who are, who are building the building and who, in principle, it would house into a polyglot of people speaking different languages and then scatters them all over the world. Well, what I think that means is that if you try to build a homogenous totalitarian structure that usurps the transcendent, it will begin to badly fragment from within. And I think it's a warning against gigantism. And I think one of the things that's happening in Europe is that we're seeing the folly of the idea of too big to fail. What we're seeing instead is the manifestation of so big it will certainly fail. And I think the reason for that is that there has to be a certain degree of homogeneity within anything that can be categorized as an organization. If the degree of heterogeneity within the organization becomes too extreme, and if the organization becomes too large, then it's very difficult for people to feel any affinity with it. They're going to 
fragment back into their subsidiary identity groups, and those might be national groups, for example, which seems to be what ha what's happening in Europe, and then the whole thing is going to fall apart. And I have some sympathy for that because I think that it's necessary for human beings at an individual level to feel some sort of affinity for the power structures that they find themselves in. And maybe being one three hundred mil one three hundred millionth of an entity is to be too much of a non-entity to feel any real um, affinity for that structure. So that's part of what I think is happening with regards to Brexit. So.